and welcome around to my house. Now, Christmas is coming and we've got a feast of festive food lined up for you this morning. We've got a dish from a genius chef behind the best restaurant in Britain. And I'll be in the kitchen with a true legend of the London food scene. Plus, my TV dad will be serving a stunning dish of scallops and smoked haddock. And we'll be joined all morning by a Strictly Come Dancing star who's the undisputed queen of Latin dancing. So what are we doing out here? Let's crack on, let's get inside, and let's get cooking. Morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. Today is going to be a good one, it really is. Because we've got the brilliant Shirley Ballis will be in the house. Uh, she's here throughout the morning, took it into a loaded potato skins with deep fried chicken and amazing fillet steak with seafood mac and cheese. Two great dishes. The legend. The legend that is Mr. Brian Turner is back. Yay! He'll be treating us to one of his trademark dishes. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass, where we'll be showing you how to make the perfect glazed ham, three ways for glazed ham uh, for Christmas. And that's not all, because I'm joined again in the house by two great friends of mine who just so happen to be two of the best chefs in the business. We have Richard Corrigan and Gareth Ward. Ching, ching, you guys. Great to see you. So, you're, what are you going to be cooking on the show? You've got, you've got an amazing dish, Richard. What are you going to be doing? I'm doing a guinea fowl uh, right. crown with a spiced sausage, uh, uh, some rhubarb, Wonderful. Uh, fig, and a little bit of pepper as well. Wonderful. You're going to do that in the wood fire oven now. I'm going to do it, and hopefully, we won't, uh, we'll keep the fire low this year. Exactly. Stop burning <laughs> my hinge as well. <laughs> and you're using the fire, but in a different way. You're using yeah, the, the little I'm grill. I'm using the little grill. I've got a matchy, so like a yellowtail sort of part of the tuna family. Okay. So I'm going to give you two little servings of it. I'm going to do the belly, the fatty part, just cooked all the barbecue really quickly. Okay. And serve the top loin raw with some wasabi, which I just picked on the way down to see you this morning. Now, two of the great <laughs> chefs in the business, you, you've never met before, <clears> No. You? No. I heard all about yeah. uh, Gareth, of course, all about He's I mean, a legend, isn't he? Well, you're, yeah. he's a legend, but you're, you're, you're building yourself with a bit of a legend because, uh, I mean, this year has been amazing for you. It's been great, say. yeah, yeah. You've cleaned up. Yeah, it's been good, yeah. I'm very happy with uh, it. Still number one restaurant in the whole of the UK. Yeah. Katie Ward for best chef. You just won everything. I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> as well. Yeah. Trust me, his food is amazing as well. But I thought we'd kick things off today with no pressure, because I'm going to cook for these two, uh, with a simple lemon posset that I'm going to serve with cookies that have come from the Isle of Man, which I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. But I love the simplicity of this dessert. I don't know about you, but I, th I think the simplicity of a little lemon posset, really simple. So we've got some beautiful li little lemons over here. I'm going to candy some rind as well, and then I'm basically, lemon posset, you can do this with orange, you can do it with lime, it's entirely up to you. But really good quality lemons is what you want. And then I've got a mixture of sugar and cream. And that's the basis of this. We're going to use a little lemon balm in it as well. That goes in there. But the first of all, to make the posset, you take some double cream. Now, fire up the stove over here. And it's important that you use double cream with this. Single cream, it won't work. So you use double cream, and then you use some sugar. That goes in there. And then we want a combination of zest and juice. So you're going to basically bring this to a gentle simmer, you need the juice from three lemons and the zest from two. That makes sense. So, a little bit of that. So, take a little bit of the zest. I mean, you're the type of restaurant that you've got, you must have possets on your well, place. I think it was the first book I ever done that had possets in it. Possets have a fantastic history as well. Yeah. I mean, they go back to medieval times, yeah. you know what I mean? So, it kind of gives you an idea of what people were. You know, when Henry V was thinking about his next wife, <laughs> with a spoonful of posset in between uh, helps the medicine go down, well, you know? The, it's all that set sort of milk puddings as well, isn't it? The, yeah. The, 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 sort of falling out of favour. Yeah. Them and bread puddings, I suppose, as well. The classic dishes like apple charlotte and all those kind of things. I love all They're that. They're the best desserts, aren't they? Well, you say that when you get that. Oh, but you caramel. you sort of modernise that in your restaurant, don't yeah, you? Yeah. I remember I mean, talking about rhubarb. He's cooking yeah. rhubarb. You you do like funky rhubarb and custard and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just like you, know. like you say, them nostalgic old flavours just done a bit differently. Isn't it's it? what people want, yeah. really. Yeah. I think so. That's we've got some we've got some lemon over here, and what you want to do is just bring this to the boil and gently simmer this. Now, I'm going to serve this with these little cookies over here because I can see you guys have got your tea and your coffee there. These are going to be perfect for this. So we're going to. Basically, introduce you now to so to find out more about where these uh, amazing cookies come from. We're heading north and setting sail across the Irish Sea to speak to Andrea and Chris Worsfold on the Isle of Man. Welcome to the show, guys. 
So, so tell okay. me, so I've got the chefs here that are about to dive into these. First of all, before we get into that, tell me, tell me about how you guys met, really, because it wasn't through food, was it? No, it, it wasn't. It was on the water down in uh, on the Isle of Wight, sailing around the Isle of Wight, which is uh, uh, obviously one of our most uh, favourite passions, that's sailing, uh, uh, which uh, eventually took us to a career on the water for 20-odd years. Because you, you had a career before the water. You, you were working in the city, weren't you? Were yeah. Yeah, I High-pressure job floor. in the city. A trading floor in the city of London, absolutely, which then took us to Bermuda. Uh, and, uh, and then we had our own hotel and restaurant in Dorset. I love this as well. What, what a career as well. You were working, you were working on, on, on luxury yachts as well, skipper on lots. And, uh, wasn't it right? One of you were doing the cooking and one of you were skippering the yacht. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I was the chef, also the first mate. And um, it's taken us around the Med, um, up and down the Caribbean. So yeah, adventurous Australia. Bahamas. People say it's, people say it's an amazing life. I've got the chefs here. We're, we're working, God knows how, how many hours in the kitchen. Is it is it everything that it thought it would be? Or I mean, because certain elements, the, the weather it can turn. It, it must be quite pressurised, is it? And people change their mind and situations. I suppose that you're in, in terms of food. People see the glam side of it, but I guess it can be quite pressurised. Very much so. Um, you know, uh, not only for Andrea having to produce three meals a day and more, but uh, also putting up with the weather, uh, technical problems with the boat, going from A to B, uh, trying to suss out your guest uh, very quickly, and, of course, uh, then walking onto the boat for weeks, usually a week's stay on board, uh, and you know very little about what they actually like and don't like. <laughs> and then you don't find out until you're in the middle of the Atlantic, one of the two, that somebody's got dietary requirements, exactly. <laughs> so, so, anyway, oh. you, you, you set this business up, because we're about to dive into this. This came about through COVID, didn't it, really? So tell, tell us about why you set it all up and how you set it all up. OK, well, yes, uh, we were back here in the Isle of Man. We've lived here for quite a number of years. And, of course, we couldn't go anywhere, what with uh, COVID restrictions, uh, totally locked down. We're not people to sit on our uh, behinds and do nothing. So uh, we decided, right, we set up this small little business called Angelica Bell and uh, started uh, producing, in this case, Amaretti cookies. So, so the guys are about to dive into this, really. So, Andrea, what's the basis of this recipe then? Can you give a lot of it away, or what, what's the base of this? Because these taste amazing. Oh my god! And look at that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Manx free-range eggs. Yeah. Uh, are, are a key ingredient, and then I uh, use a blend of uh, different almonds, uh, some from the Mediterranean oh, and one. some from the Caribbean, and then. Uh, lemon, which really enhances the flavour rather than a, a plain uh, amaretti cookie. And we came uh, across these in Sardinia and right. Sicily, and we just loved them on the boat. And during COVID, I thought, um, what product uh, would travel well to the UK via post and came up with the amaretti? Well, you've got two converts over here. Before we yeah. get to it, I just want to recap here. I've got my lemon and lemon zest gone in there. I boiled up the, the milk and the cream, and all we do is just pour this into the little pots that you want to put it in. Allow this to set in the fridge overnight, and you've got a simple little pot set. I've got some candied lemon over here. We, but we got nods of approval from both of our chefs. Mm, beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank so, you, 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 uh, so you said about this business making it in your kitchen, I'm assuming, in the middle of COVID land. And then, then yes. you're now... Was it, was it for locals and bits and pieces in the Isle of Man? More for um, family, initially, yeah. to send to family as gifts. And then, uh, and then we just elaborated on the packaging and the postal side of things. And, um, and then we wholesale to a number of people here in the Isle of Man and we go to uh, food and drink festivals and market stalls. And uh, and then online, I think, like you say, because a lot of the times you taste these, they're very, very dry. Yeah, mm. yeah and, 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 and like you say, overly sweet. But these, these have got and, and the recipe from it. This idea came from Sardinia. 
Yes, from Sardinia. We, we did a lot of sailing around Sardinia. And Sicily. And, and it's just from. one of our yeah. favourite places for sailing. Uh, and, and, of course, the food is unbelievable there. Uh, and uh, it was it was what can you come up with uh, that's that's going to travel well and look appealing and have a multitude of uses as well. Well, uh, uh, you've got nods of approval over here now, Andrea. I think we were separated at birth, me and you, because we both got passions in our lives. We got we got flying. I believe you're, a, you're you've got your private pilot's license as well. Yes, I do. And you named the company after your love of classic cars, because I know the Isle of Man has got a, a huge connection with the classic car business as well. Yeah. Abs absolutely. So uh, Angelica is a Austin Healey BN1 uh, 1954, and uh, Bell is a uh, MGTC 1948. Now there are other oh. ingredients that you can get from as well, because I know you you buy a couple of your ingredients from the yeah. restaurant from the Isle of Man. Yeah. And scallops and bits of pieces. Scallops, yeah. I mean, fantastic queenies come from the Isle of Man, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we get some lovely oysters not far from you as well. So, you know, it's a uh, great, great place, great food, great, great, great TT racing second. as well. You, exactly. know? Yeah. you can probably see it from yeah. where you are, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I'm giving a wave next time. Exactly, you? where you're based. <laughs> Well, I wish you all the very best with it. I'm just going to finish this off. I've taken your biscuits for a little bit of texture. We've got some of this little, little, little bit of lemon balm over the top with your nice little bit of candied. So the lemon uh, lemon zest I've just basically sliced up. I've cooked that to in a little bit of sugar. That's gone in there. And then what you do is you take it out of the sugar, then mix it together with a little bit of sugar anyway, so it goes candied, that kind of stuff. You can warm this in the oven if you want to dry them all out to make them crisp. But there we have it, my little version of these lovely little lemon possets. We don't forget your amazing little uh, biscuits over the top. Easy as that. Thank you, James. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. There we go, gentlemen. Wow. Awesome. Well, tell me what you think. These biscuits, I think, make it as well. Or not, like I say, not too sweet. Oh. It's a great pudding. It's such a simple little dessert, isn't it? Honestly, unbelievable. But people got so much stress around at Christmas, something like that. Mm. So it's a really simple little dessert. Yeah. No curdling of eggs problem. You know, just yeah. nice lemon and juice. Easy. It's mega. Lovely, and then it? biscuits are really well, go really well with it. R biscuits are great as well, yeah. there you go. Right, yeah. now these two will be cooking for us shortly. And Brian Turner will be dropping by the house with a recipe for scallops and haddock a little bit later. But join us again after the break when we'll be enjoying a festive recipe from the Saturday Morning Archives. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, Mr. Richard Corrigan will be cooking for us very shortly, and I'll be serving up a surf and turf for Strictly Come Dancing's Shirley Ballas in just a couple of minutes. But first, it's time for another recipe, and this week we're dipping into the archives to enjoy a spot of festive baking from the one and only Rachel Allen. Enjoy this one. It's Christmas time, so what better than to do some lovely festive baking? And I'm going to make these really delicious pistachio and cardamom swirls. These two flavors are so good together. I'm going to make the cardamom butter, pistachio and cardamom butter first. And in here I've got some soft butter. There, that's good. If it's soft, it's just gonna make it a lot easier for you. And then add in caster sugar. And you want this butter to be really good and soft, otherwise it's going to be difficult to spread out over the dough. Okay, that's good. And then some lemon zest. And you just want to grate the very outer part of the zest, not the bitter white pith. So you just get that really great citrusy zing. Okay, that's good. Then some cardamom. I've peeled open the green cardamom pods and crushed the cardamom seeds and you have this really incredible aroma of the cardamom and when mixed with the lemon zest and then the pistachios too this is going to be really special so i need a teaspoon so put that into the butter and i need the rest of the cardamom for the dough itself mix this cardamom and lemon go together really well there. You could, of course, play around with other flavours in this. You could put orange zest with cinnamon in, or ginger, mixed spice, instead of the lemon and cardamom. 
and then pistachios. Chopped pistachios. I haven't toasted these pistachios, just plain chopped. Mix this around and now you have your cardamom pistachio butter. So that's the butter. Next thing, I'm gonna make the dough. I've got regular plain flour in here and I'm going to add in some caster sugar. There, make it lovely and sweet. And some baking powder. Okay, mix those two together and then I'm going to rub in a little bit of butter to give it a nice soft crumb. So, tip in the butter. And rub it in. Make sure you have an oven preheated. This is going to go into a hot oven at first. And then going to turn it down after about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and cook it for about another 25 minutes. Baking at Christmas time can be just really special and you can experiment with different spices, lovely flavors. It can be a bit indulgent as well. There, that's good, the butter's rubbed in. Okay, and now add in the rest of the cardamom. It smells incredible. There. And then whisk an egg. use just all milk but the egg of course is going to make it even a little bit richer and some milk fresh milk in. okay so make it well in the center pour in the egg and the milk I like to mix this by hand because I find that sometimes if I use a wooden spoon it can just get over mixed if you put your hand in like a claw like that and just around and around. It will come together using a nice big mixing bowl like this. Keep mixing until it all comes together. And then as soon as it comes together, you stop mixing. You, if you over mix this, you're just gonna work the gluten in the flour and it's gonna be tough and heavy. So that's it, it's come together. Take a little bit of flour, scatter it onto your worktop and tip the dough out onto your floured work surface. Let's turn it over in the flour like that. Now, I'll go and wash my hands. Okay, flour your hands. And then just roll the dough out until it's kind of a rectangle the size of you know, an A4 sheet of paper. I don't want it to stick though, so just making sure it doesn't stick to the worktop. So you want to roll it into a nice long rectangle like this. Imagine I need to get about 12 slices. Okay, that's long enough. And then take the butter, which smells amazing. The cardamom, lemon and pistachio. So you see, if the butter is not soft enough here, it's gonna be a real pain to spread it out. You can keep it in slightly from the edges here, but all the way out to these ends there. Great, okay. So I need to roll it this way. And if a little bit sticks, don't worry, just get, take a palette knife, slightly floured, and just scrape it like that. If you're finding it sticking a tiny bit, just take some of your flour and scrape it, that's okay. Look at that big roll. Okay, bring it towards you just like this. Okay, that's nice and even. And then I'm going to cut this into slices and I'm going to put it into the tin. The tin has been buttered on the base and the sides. I normally just cut it in half first. Like that. And if you find it easier just to flour the blade after you cut it so it doesn't stick to the next slice. Okay. And cut each of these into three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. And then what you want to do is you want to put these in cut side facing up because then as these are cooked, they're going to form this gorgeous swirl. Cut side facing up, all sitting snugly and happily and cosily. Look at this little tin. Round them off a little bit, just keep the shapes. 
put them into the tin and you see when I'm putting them into the tin, there's a bit of space in between. That's okay, they're going to spread a bit as they bake. That's gonna go now into the oven to bake. Hot oven for about 15 to 20 minutes until it gets lots of lovely color and then turn the oven down and cook it for about another 25 minutes. Great. That is lovely. It's ready, it's golden brown around the outside. Oh, look, the cardamom, lemon, pistachio butter is caramelized and bubbling up. Okay, so just loosen it around the edges while it's still a little bit hot. And then sit it on an upturned bowl. And it allows, you see, the sides of the tin to fall down. You just need to work to loosen it a little bit, like that. Slide it off. It comes off easily because I've buttered the base. Oh, there. You can decorate it with some honey, which is actually going to soak in because the swirls are still hot. And the honey's going to work really well with these flavors, the cardamom, the pistachio, and the lemon. It's nice and hot, great. It's going to form a lovely sticky glaze. And then, I've got some toasted pistachios. So I chopped the pistachios like I did for the butter inside. Just put them into a hot oven, the preheated oven for the swirls. And I cooked the pistachios for about three or four minutes. And that is a gorgeous bit of festive baking. My cardamom and pistachio swirls. And the idea here is everyone can just break off their own little swirl. Yay, it's Christmas. Now, a fantastic recipe from Rachel. Now, the very talented Gareth Ward will be showing two mind-blowing tuna recipes from his multi-Michelin-star restaurant a little bit later. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass, where I'll be showing you three different ways to glaze your Christmas hams. But I'll see you back here in a few minutes when we're chatting to Shirley Ballas over seafood mac and cheese. Oh, and don't forget the fillet steak that goes along the side. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'll be giving you a masterclass in glazing your own Christmas hams, and Chef Richard Corrigan will be laying on a dish of guinea fowl. That's coming up next. But first, we've had Craig Greville Hallward on the show, and I've cooked for Anton de Beck so many times I can't even remember. Uh, but it's an honour to finally to be joined in the house by the real star of Strictly Come Dancing. But don't tell Anton. It's the brilliant <laughs> Shirley Ballas! <laughs> Good to have you on the show. Yes. We finally got you on the show. I'm so excited. So I thought you sent us, kindly sent us a load of dishes that you like. So I'm going to cook for you quite a lot, actually, today. We've got two dishes in the, the end part and two dishes now. So wow. we're going to show you how to cook a steak, amazing fillet steak, because it's a little treat with it being Christmas. And I'm going to do this with seafood mac and cheese, because I know you like your mac and cheese, but this is kind of like a surf and turf sort of thing, really. I was reading all about you last night, and what a career, Thank first you. of all. But I knew a little bit about your career, and I said a little bit about your career, because it's 18 years since I did Strictly. Can you believe it's 18 years? 18 years since I did it. But I remember when I was doing this, we, we used to watch videos of you doing the really? Latin. Yeah, because not even... I'm going to say this, because the pros won't admit it, but there was one of these routines that you did. It was just incredible. Not even the pros could do it as well. Where did you, you... You fell in love with with dancing through peering through a window, didn't you? You were doing something else as a young kid. I did. I was doing CPR on a dummy in the brownies. Um, right. The girl guides and brownies were all together and I was doing the CPR. Then I heard this music and then I thought, where's that coming from? So I excused myself to go to the loo, found this door, it had a lovely little peephole in it, so I dragged up to look and I could see these people moving, but I didn't know what they were doing. And that's how it all began. But was it was the music that drew you into it first? It was, was music it? that drew me. So, And then when I saw them moving so beautifully to the music, and they actually, I realise now, were relative beginners. It was like a, you know, a normal little class in the week for them. But that's what drew me was the music. I've always had a love for music and I've always just totally in love with movement. But then going from that, it happened 
<laughs> Unbelievably quick. Were you teaching people to dance at 17? I certainly was. I taught a gentleman called Mr Nymph the waltz. I remember it was for five pounds for half an hour. Right. <laughs> and at the time, I was working in a solicitor's as an office junior, getting about 14 pounds a week. But you so say I... you weren't very good at, as, as a secretary. You weren't, it wasn't your forte. I was by far the worst secretary that one could ever find. Right. I was just totally underqualified for it. But I did find my calling, you could say, in teaching. A little bit nerve-wracking, but I found it in calling and realised that there was, even at £5 for half an hour, was going to be a lot better than £16 for a whole week. So, how, tell, me, tell me how you go from that, at that age, to, to then the stratospheric rise that you did. Because you risked you risk quite a lot when you were a young kid. You, you weren't frightened to move, you weren't frightened to change dance partners as well. You, I mean... But you were, but you weren't. You had it. Was that always the goal for you? That mission? Or I don't think anything was ever the goal. It was just sometimes you're offered two ways to go, and then you choose the destiny that you want to go or the road you want to take. I've moved 28 times in my life. I'm not attached to anything at all. But I left home when I was 14, moved to Yorkshire, met Nigel Tiffany, British ballroom dance champion, fell in love, got engaged, moved to London at 16, the bright lights with not a penny in my pocket. And then we were going to get married and have babies, and I got a job there I was underqualified for. And then my teacher said, what do you want to do? You want to have babies, you want to get married, or would you like an opportunity to hit the big time and dance with a man called Sammy Stopford? I said, well, can I go home and talk to my fiancé? She said, no, you've got ten minutes, and I would suggest you don't tell him. And, uh, and then from there, I, I, I got to know Sammy Stopford, and it was a meteoric rise at 17. We was won everything. ten times US Latin champion? No. Oh, hold on. So I married Sammy right. at 18. We had five years together. To yeah. this. We won everything, the youngest female to ever do that. And then I ran off with Corky Ballas to America. Was there three months, decided I'd made a mistake, called Sammy, can I come back? He said, no. So I taught Corky to dance from scratch, all the international things. I won the championship in 83, came back in 84, and only made the first round. And I felt in Great Britain, everybody had sort of said, you know, you left, you made your bed, you lie in it, basically. And then I decided that I was going to do everything I could to get back into that top six, whatever it took. In the meantime, I had a baby, moved back to Great Britain in 1990, and in 1995, Corky and I won the British Open to the World Championships and my ex-husband was second. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Deserves a round of applause, didn't it? That even alone! So, and then went on to win it again, so, you know, it was really... But that's been your entire... Your, your life story is... I mean, this it's got to be a film. Surely you can't put... You've got to be able to put this in a film. Yeah, well, I would like to think that that is a possibility for sure. But it was, it was a journey, you know, it was difficult. I'm not saying it was like swimming upstream at certain points. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite difficult. And everybody said, you're wasting your time, he's a beginner, he's a chef. It made a great banoffee pie. <laughs> anyway, you'll never make it back again in the I'm industry. I'm risking it with this steak and mac and cheese, <laughs> then, <laughs> But Banoffee pie would have been a lot easier. <laughs> and anyway, we did, so we proved people that when they say you can't, you can. You just have to find the right avenue to be able to do that, so... But I get the feeling that's always been, like, all your life as well, isn't it, really? I mean, we, we, we're here to talk about the book as well, because this is... You've not just written... One book. You've written numerous books. This is something a new venture for you, though. T tell us about this, because this is this is something very different. Well, I wanted to write my autobiography, so I wrote my autobiography. But there were so many stories in it that they wouldn't let me put in the book for Funny one, that. <laughs> one reason or another. Yeah. So my mum said, "Why don't you write a cosy crime novel?" You know, she loves to read. My mum, she's an avid reader. She said, "I think you could put everybody with fictitious characters, and you could write your 55 years of experience behind the scenes." It's a bit saucy, you know, I, I witnessed all sorts of things. I mean, the whole book is built on sex, lies, intrigue, backstabbing, bed-hopping, manipulation, bullying and a little bit of ballroom dancing going on there. <laughs> so it's, it's 55 years of whatever I've witnessed, you know, so that's the reason why I wrote it, with the encouragement of my mother. And, and it turned out, actually, to be a really good read. My mum read it. And then I went upstairs and I said, well, you're going to read it overnight? Which is what she normally does. And she said, I am. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, she was shouting, you didn't do this. Did you witness it? Were you part of it? What's wrong with you, child? <laughs> but look, we've got our prawn, we've got our... This is our seafood mac and cheese, which has got in there, so I've mixed together with a little brown shrimp over there, a little bit of crab. The prawn sits on there with some nice little bit of cheese. That's going to sit under our grill, which That's is... a big there. oven. 
A big oven, yeah. And then we've got our steak. So I've got some fillet steak over here, because it doesn't take very long to cook a fillet. Hopefully you don't want this well done. No. How would you like the fillet steak? Medium rare, I'll Medium take it. rare, I can do that. So the key to cooking a fillet steak, medium rare, is to have a nice hot pan on the stove. And then I use some vegetable oil. Touch of vegetable oil in our pan, get this nice and hot, and then we just pop our steaks in the pan. So very, very hot pan. Pop our steaks in the pan. And these are going to probably take no more than about a minute and a half on each side to cook. Wow. That's all. And then we're going to finish this off with butter and a little bit of this sort of stock cube to go with it. So when was the phone call for you? When was the, when was the Strictly moment? Because I suppose even back then when you were world champion, Strictly was still around then and then it went off air for a while. Because, you know, ballroom dancing and, and Latin dancing was this quite not niche market, but it, it, it went global all of a sudden, didn't it? It went well, crazy. My son was on Dancing with the Stars in the US, so I lived there for 11 years while he was on that show. I met Bruno. And then in 2017, when I was being badly bullied in my own industry, I decided I was going to take a different course, maybe a yoga course or a keep fit. You know, there was people in the industry stopping my work. And really? in 2017, my son said to me, why don't you go for Uncle Lenny's job? We've known Len all our life. He was one of my teachers. My son had some inside scoop. So basically, to cut a long story short, I said to him, you know, who's going to take a 57-year-old woman with zero TV experience on a show like that? You've only got to watch YouTube to watch this one dance to realise you should have <laughs> taken anybody. <laughs> no problem. But I went for the interview, paid for it myself, went there, did an absolutely disastrous interview because they sat me next to this rather large man which was Craig Revel Horwood. <laughs> I didn't know him, I'd never met him, and he was right. looking at me because I couldn't string two words together when they put Anne Whittacombe on for me to criticise. I, I had never quite seen anything like that. Right. <laughs> but that was my introduction to Strictly Come Dancing. They asked me, how did you think you do? I told them it was rubbish. So they brought me back a second time for a second interview with just jeans on and a blouse and one executive producer and a camera. And, uh, and my son helped me, you do this, this and this, and then I nailed that interview. And, and the rest was history. So we've just got our steak over here. This has gone in. We've got a nice little bit of steak. We're going to finish this off, because we've got chefs on the show as well. He's multi-mission in our chefs. we finish this off in butter. And we need a decent amount of butter in here. Take some black pepper now, over the top, like that. And then this is this little secret. This, you take a stock cube, a little bit of beef stock cube over the top. And then you can decide how well you want it cooked, which I know this is going to be ready. We then just take this off and nappe the butter All over that the butter? All the butter, but what this does is gives you... It slows you down when you're dancing. You don't this, calorie <laughs> count then when you're making this, do you? I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is the reason why I didn't read the finals, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I blame this, to be honest with you. Not me. Not, not the fact of me, but look. You take the steak like that, and we're just going to leave that now to rest. So that's got a little bit of the stock cube in there as well. So wow. before we wrap this up, Tell us a little bit about the story of the book, then, because it starts off with one main character in it. There's a, there's a death in a competition. So I'm Lily. We start the competition in Whitby, where we do the qualifying rounds, and then yep. I take it to Blackpool. And there's a beautiful character in there called Oksana Bondarenko, and she goes to, <laughs> into the embrace of Jack for the beautiful romantic tango, and she drops dead at his feet. Who right. murdered Oksana Bondarenko? And nobody who's read the book, by the way, ever got the murderer, just so that you know. Right. And then uh, there's quite a few people that get murdered in this book. So I think the whole thing put together... I mean, like I say, did I witness it? Is it fiction? Did I take part in it? They're the questions that you have to so ask. So I get the feeling there's two books in the pipeline, is this? Yes, this is my other book is Dance to the Death. That's written, that's already been edited at the right. moment. That'll be out next Christmas, because there's just far too many stories. And the thing with this, bit like Coronation Street, it's ongoing, you know, in my industry, there's always a drama and there's always something going on. So it gives me plenty to write about. Shall we well, it's been it's been a pleasure talking. You're going to stick around for the rest of the yes. rest of the morning as well. But look, you've got this is your simple little mac and cheese. That you've <laughs> well, got your yes. your shrimp. I'm so excited to eat that. I mean, that's cheese. a treat for me. You know that, right? It's a treat for me and all. But look, you take a little treat. bit of that. Wow. And then you've got your nice little bit of steak. So you want to take the steak like that, just finish it off with a little bit of butter <laughs> over the top. And we can lift this off. That will sit on there. And then we've got a little plushy watercress. Sits with it. But there we have it. My version of a simple little surf and turf. Done. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you.
there we have it. Thank Dish you very one. much. Dive into that one. Wow. Oh, this looks lovely. So, well, surf mac and, and cheese. Surf. We'll try that. That's a real yummy treat. A little bit of crab. Oh. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I'm not sharing with anyone. Your steak. Tell me what you think of that. <laughs> little bit of, little bit of. Well, bit. how about the knife just goes straight through it? So. Well, that's because that's because you allowed it to rest before you eat it, but also you cook it at room temperature. So you cook like I dance. There you go. I, yes, I can. <laughs> I can cook better than I can dance. Put it that way. Shirley Vars, everybody. <laughs> Right, I'm going to treat you, Shirley, to loaded potato skins and deep-fried chicken later on this morning. We've got a masterclass in Christmas ham. Uh, but join us again after the break when Mr Richard Corrigan will be wowing us with a recipe for guinea fowl. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, there's still loads more to come from my guest, Shirley Ballas, and I'll be sharing my recipes for the perfect glazed hams in this week's Christmassy Masterclass. But first, I'm here with Mr Gareth Ward, and we're about to get a Masterclass of our very own in cooking game from the true giant of the food world, whose CV includes stints behind the hobs of London's most famous restaurants <laughs> that he just now happens to own. It's Richard Corrigan, of course! Yeah. Great to have you back. Great to see now, you. Now, you're a bit nervous cooking for this fella, are you? I am, I'll be honest with you. You'll <laughs> yeah, be fine, no, well... He's so many number ones, it's well, like one, he, one, 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 one. He's you know cleaned, up, the cleaned up this year. The and best he, the best. So what are we going to be doing then? What are we, uh, we going to Guinea fowl, I, you know, it's Christmas time. And I just think it's a, it's, it's not terribly expensive as well. Yeah. I think I always look at them as good value. I yeah. think they'd always need a little perk up, like a pheasant. Okay. And you know what I mean, uh, like a sausage bread with <coughs> chorizo yeah. or a, a nuja. You know what I mean. So you're, you've you got the. We're just going to finish yeah. this off. You've got the nenduya, which is like a yeah. it's Calabrian sort of a spicy sausage. But it's it's quite strong, yeah, isn't it? Really, strong. it's quite yourself. strong, and it's been used everywhere, overused in menus sometimes. You know, right. so you have to be really careful. Yeah. And I mix it with a bit of mascarpone. All right, okay, uh, soften it down a bit. Yeah, soften it down. There's no breadcrumb in it. I, yeah. You could put breadcrumb in it if you want to be really clever arse. You know what I mean, really? And, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's only, it's only James Martin. Why would I put breadcrumbs in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit of stuffing underneath the skin. I've loosened yeah. the skin with my finger just beforehand. Yeah. And be good and generous, yeah. So what is that, about 50-50 mix? Or? It's, a, it's, it's less. It's around 60-40. Right. right. And... Uh, the creaminess of the mascarpone in there really works well okay. as well, James. Yeah. And I just, I just, you know, you just give it a... But it's also going to help in terms of keeping... Because one thing you don't want to be doing with this is overcooking it. No, they, they can no. go. I always say, if you've got to put that uh, crown into an oven, it's around 35 minutes. Yeah. Core, you want a kind of a core temperature inside around 60, 62. Yeah. And rest it. Rest yeah. it really well. So, you know what I mean? Don't be afraid to... I'll let you season it. Do you want to... Yeah. Put the, the I'm just going to wash my hands first. You, I'll put the salt and pepper on Please. it. Please. Bit of that. Yeah. Do you want some salt in it as well? Yes, please. Yeah, not a lot, just a little bit. And of course, we have a little bit of. Why not? We can give it the whole winter, the winter umps. Yeah. And in that goes. And then just at the side, just stick that just in there. There you go. Right. right. I'll let you wash your hands, and I'll, yeah. I'll go do this. So, so this, you said 35 minutes in the oven, yeah? Yeah, around in a, in, a, in in an oven or a wood burning oven, maybe 35, 40. But you are looking for core temperature around 60, 62, 63, okay. well rested. So sounds good. So what are we going to serve that with? Because you've got We're, a selection of bits and pieces. We aren't going to serve that with a little kind of a call it a little vegetable autumnal winter casserole. Right. So uh, almost so, like the ratatouille, but winter version. A, a winter version. So yeah. a tiny little bit of oil. Okay. Now, you, as well as this chap being busy, you've been busy this year as well. What's this? Tell, tell me about this freedom of the city of London, because I find this fascinating. My dad's got this, and you've, you've got one as well. I put the sheep over the bridge. <laughs> so, put the sheep over the bridge. This allows you to take sheep over... Is it Tower Bridge, London Bridge? Yeah, London it is. Bridge? Uh, it's London Bridge. London Bridge. And, uh, but what was that like for you? Because you've been in London for how long now? I mentioned London at the top of this. 35, 36 years. Wow. Well, 36 years. And uh, I started, I remember walking into London with a, with a case. Right. And, you know, this dream is the immigrant, you know? Like, New York is paved <laughs> with gold. Yeah. Well, you know, forget about it. <laughs> London is one of the greatest cities in the world. Yeah. You still think that after 35 right. years? Because uh, so much has changed in London, hasn't no, it, really? I, on, and James, London is one of the greatest cities in the world. It's, it's, I won't change my mind on that. I've made up my view on it. Yeah. If you're ambitious and you want to get on, 
you know, London comes to you. Because Corrigan's, yeah. Corrigan's, yeah. Cor Corrigan's, you said, that's in Mayfair. Well, the great, the great sadness this year, Nico Landin has passed away. Yeah. One of the great chefs in London. And my site in, in Mayfair was, was Nico's, was Nico's kitchen, believe it or not. And it yeah. still is Nico's kitchen, because I never, because I'm a farmer, so I don't throw everything into a skip. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I keep everything. Because I remember it being on Park Lane. Was that the restaurant that was around? on the Park Lane. I just moved right. the entrance. OK. I just moved the entrance around a little bit. Right. And uh, it works very well. So, so, so you start off with the onions. Start off with the yeah. onions, right? That's the key in there. Now I'm going to put in the rhubarb. So what do you... You, 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 put, you just put rhubarb in there. Rhubarb in there. Right. Some step in there. Yeah. And I just, n now you need to be careful. We don't want to fry the sep. I don't like fried mushroom. I like. Yeah, Andy, like something... me. It's wilted mushroom, isn't it? Just yeah, like wilted. lightly cooked. God, I'm glad I'm still on trend. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Gareth. You're, <laughs> no, you're making me sound good here, yeah. you know? Keep talking, yeah? I don't like fried mushroom, heavily fried mushroom. Just got it just cooked, isn't yeah. it? Just, just, just cooked. And, yeah. and, and don't be afraid ever of controlling that temperature with a bit of water. OK. So just a little so bit. So now you, you cook the you cook the guinea fowl that we've got on here. The guinea fowl is cooking away I'll bring there. this one over here. This is the one that's been... Oh, that's just one. Cooked. You've got amazing juices from here, though. This is the, this is oh, the lovely, lovely juices. Lovely. From... And some of that will go in here as well, but not a lot. OK. So right, so we've got that. That's then resting. Now, that's resting there. Now, the key is we have some figs here. Right. And really important for me... Yeah. It's just, do that too. yeah, would you put that just in at the side? Just let it rest there, lovely. Okay. Is basically just take the, the skin off the figs. So you peel the figs? Peel the figs. Right. Why? I think figs, first of all, I never know what's sprayed on them. And I'm never happy with the flavour of the outside of the fig. Right. It just doesn't do anything for me. And I think it always should be removed. Like, sometimes you peel an apple, sometimes you don't. But this dish, I'll, I'd, I'd like it peeled. And these just need warming in the mixture, really. Yeah. But you managed to you managed to t take existing restaurants like Corrigan's, but yeah. then take on take on iconic restaurants like Bentley's because it's Bentley's is one of my favourite yeah, favourite class. places, and particularly your love of seafood shines through there. But, but particularly oysters. I think you know the the whole feeling about places like Bentley's is. You're custodian of these restaurants, and if you think you own them, then you have something else. So how long has Bentley's know, been there? Bentley's is there since 1916. Right. And you know, but I, it, it, I'd hate to feel that anyone felt I didn't do it any justice whatsoever. Yeah. Now you're talking. Yeah. And then I'll just give it a tiny bit of acid. No more, no more. Just and take that off. Here, just a little bit of this. Oh, sorry. Right. Just a tiny, just, 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 just no more. <laughs> okay. That's I'll it. I'll leave that on there. And you just leave that there. And I just think when you're when you're feeling that, you could have a slice of turkey on that. You could have a nice yeah. chicken. And then that. what you've got in here? What have you got in, in That's here? That's just cauliflower. It's cream, cream. Right. Milk, cauliflower, lots of it. Just puree it down in a liquidizer. And I like it because I think it goes really well with the whole thing. Right, so that's the cauliflower. Yeah, and you've got something else in here. What, what is this? This is the... That is a, a little bit extra that I'd put in there. Right. That I brought <laughs> with me. Right. Yeah. And I don't need it, right? Oh, you don't need One it? My chef's put it in. All right, so this uh, is for my supper for later. for your supper for later, okay. yeah? All right. And I just think, look at that guinea fowl, lovely. I mean, the best thing about the guinea fowl is just, I think, the wings, yeah. And you just take a... But I've known you for several decades now. You still love food as much as you loved it the first time I met you. I love, I love growing us. I love cooking yeah. us. I love people in the business. Yeah. I just love the whole game, really. You know it's a magical I mean, really? job, isn't it, really? Uh, we feel very know, lucky yeah. doing this. And that's, you know what yeah, I mean? Perfect. And if you find it's a little bit too too little pinky for those delicate morsels of people out there we're working with today. <laughs> you know what I mean, really? What about this? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> you can always just put it back in the pan right. to give it. And, you know, you take a nice bit of puree. Just like you say, nice proper family, cooking, pro proper, proper taste. Then we take a little bit of our... Lovely, James, beautiful. And we take... That looks and smells amazing. 
what I will do. I know, I and know so this is your this is your vegetable as well, so you know, be generous. So I'm just gonna hmm. so a little squeeze of lemon, tiny little bit of seasoning. I get it. Try that like. And better peeled. Where else what is there? Want? I was just looking for my pan. Which there, that's just... the juice, you see? Yeah, no, no, just that piece of set there. I can't <laughs> and a little bit of juice, James, Jared. Would you pour a little bit over that? Go on, just a little yeah, bit. No, no, yeah. So give us the name of this dish, then? It's the guinea fowl with a uh, rhubarb, seps and fig, with a cauliflower and uh, a little bit of spice sausage. With one of the on true Jura. legends of the food world. Richard yeah. Corrigan, everybody. Thank you. Yay! You, Mr. Ward. Thanks very much. There you have it. Yeah. There you have it. Unbelievable. Super, that. super tasty. There's your knives and forks. Thanks very much. There we go. Dive in. Tominal feast. <laughs> exactly. And like I said, that nanduya is just whether you do it with mm. a little bit, you put mascarpone with you, put butter in it. It's just, it's beautiful, isn't it? Really. Yeah, and it's good. Yeah, and it's only left over. You can mix in a bit of pasta. Yeah, it is. You know what I mean? It makes yeah. a great lunch as well. Yeah, you know? I think it's absolutely delicious. But mm. delicious, mate. It's a proper chef. Yeah. Proper cooking. Proper chef. It's as easy as that. Richard Corrigan, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, pal. Legend. Uh, right, Gareth will be cooking for us a little bit later, and I'll be serving up a second course for my guest, Shirley Ballas, at the end of the show. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're back in the kitchen with my old dear friend and a friend of the show as well, Mr Brian Turner. I'll see you oh, in a bit. Legend. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'll be giving you a mass class in preparing the perfect Christmas hams. And I'll be finishing off the show in style while making loaded potato skins for my guest, Shirley Ballas. That and deep fried chicken. But first, Christmas is a time to get together with family and friends. So it's great to have Gareth and, of course, Richard to be here. But this gentleman as well, as cooking with me, is my TV dad. It's the brilliant Brian Turner! <laughs> Happy Christmas, fella. Happy so, Christmas, lad. Happy Christmas to you. So what are we going to be making then? What are you going to be making for us? Well, I'm a dish... We, I'm doing a dish which in the 1970s was the king of the dishes. Yeah. It marries together scallops, fresh scallops, smoked haddock, not, yeah. not dyed, yeah. and a, a little vegetables, yeah. and in sparkly... It, it, it used to be... Champagne. Champagne, but now it's... The king of well, we know we've got amazing wines. fizz in this country as well. Anyway, so I know you want to get on and do this sort of this haddock, and particularly you've got the the non-dyed stuff over here, which these gentlemen have got your eye on. It's one of your favourite foods, isn't it? Really, I both love, of you. I love haddock. Unbelievable. So there's your there's your haddock. Now those people are just tuning in as well. Probably the first time you've seen you on TV in a while. You've not been very well recently. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that... you're doing an amazing job raising money for a, a certain charity and certain certain to raise awareness for this. So t tell us tell us the 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 awareness the, that you're raising. The nuts and bolts is that I had a stroke nearly 18 months ago and I'm recovering, but very slowly. And the Stroke Association uh, used me whenever possible to spread the message and yeah. that's, and they're doing a damn good job. So I'm gonna layer this up. Now you do an amazing job for the charity that you've been involved in with this, fast. First one is F. I'm putting you to the test here. Yeah, yeah. F face. Yeah. The, no, 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 not sunken. Yeah. A. A for arms. Can you raise your arms? Yeah. S. Speech. Speech. And then T. And then T for time. Got it. Because we got to get people to hospital very fast if they have a the stroke. You... And that's the big message. That's the massive message as well. Thank but you. Uh, you remembered it. Well, with that, you are held. Ah, it doesn't matter, mate. Right, so we've got in here, look, we've got, we've got in here because the guys are waiting for something to eat. So what, what do we do with the scallops, then? You've layered those up. No salt and pepper? No, no salt and pepper. I, I like to, to do the, the dish is a pure, just marriage of ingredient, okay. uh, ingredient, ingredients. Yeah. And the... So you want to steam these? Steam, about six or eight minutes, but don't overcook them. I'm going to lift one on there and one on there. 
OK, but you keep them in the paper so you can keep the juice, is that right? I... Uh, the, the tricks... You, you might... Richard might remember the tricks to keep the buttered paper. Yeah. To keep. <laughs> well, I love cooking with the butter paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll still do it. I'm the other. Oh, when I, uh, when I teed them in the bin, there'd be, yeah, yeah. There'd be, there'd be, there'd be you, you know, my, a little bit of. Exactly. Well, what you do yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Absolutely. That's the best. Now, I say this. We, we, people <laughs> used to be killed. Yeah. Not metaphorically, but people. Yeah. Used to be killed to the store of butter papers. Of rest so don't lose the butter paper. paper. Right. So in here you got some stock. So explain to us what we got in here. All, all a, a, a little bit of water and wine, and a bit of leeks and shallots. And it also it's just to add add a bit of flavour to the um, to, 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 to the to the stock. The so you don't waste the, anything. I, we come from Yorkshire. Well, then. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> not, you not... you learned your you learned your trade in it. Uh, your dad had a, a transport calf, didn't he? Yeah, oh, fantastic. Just, I was head chef for about ten years. Or, right. Uh, uh, of, uh, of I'm old. the only chef. Yeah. And then, well, then <laughs> our two brothers and sisters. Younger. <laughs> right. So I've got some shallot on here. You want a little bit of shallot? Yeah. How much butter would you like in there? More. Excuse me. More then. All right. <laughs> Are we on a budget? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, though, can't you? It's, Chris it's Christmas time. Right, no, so right. Just melt butter. Shallot? Yes. In there. Right, OK, a little bit of shallot. So this is for the sauce. Okay. This takes six minutes. But six minutes. Have, have your time in. I've got it in my head. No problem. It's fine. This okay. one. So there's, there's, it was a champagne butter sauce originally, yeah. but now, thanks to the... Fantastic quality of British sparkling wines, then. Which is down the road. This one is. This one is funny. Oh, enough, this, one, this one's from less than ten miles away. This one. So this is a this is a little local fizz, award-winning fizz. I think this is amazing. This one as well. But but I think that I mean the English sparkler has just got. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing now, isn't it? Really, but there you have it. Cheers, Brian. Brian. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Merry Brian. Christmas, Merry guys. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. There you go. Ching, ching, ching. Ching, ching. Right. Now, were, weren't you one of the first Michelin star chefs in the UK? Yes. With Richard Shepherd. That deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> one, of, one of the first, with Mr Shepherd. With Mr Shepherd. Yeah. We were the fern, first English. So where team. were you working? Where, where was that at that moment <clears> in time? The Capitol Hotel. And, and so, what made you come to London in the first place? As you Yorkshire lad, from your transport calf, what, well, what took you to London? In in the in those days, you had to major hotels to apply to the Savoy, yeah. the Dorchester, Park Lane hotels, and then just to drop because we we don't. Okay. A bit more. It's just me. Well, is there no budget on this one? Yeah, just. It's, it's your bottle, so it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, and, and, and otherwise, you, you used to employ... You applied to work on the... Um, the, the boats, the cruise ships. Yeah. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't receive any replies apart right. from one at Simpsons in the Strand, which was owned by the Savoy Hotel. Yeah. At that at moment in time. An iconic place in London. Yeah, amazing. Iconic place. Yeah. Right, so with this is reducing down. What's next? Uh, shallots would... OK, right, Green? a little bit of vinegar. A little bit of vinegar. Tell me how much. No, no. Thumb. That's all. OK. R put it all in. Remember, you can use less and add yeah. it, but you can't use more and take it away. Yeah. So just be Love careful. It. Cream? Now, cream. Tell me, or stock, stock first. So this is the stock. How long have you cooked the stock for? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. All right, now we crank it up a bit. Cream? Yeah. Tell me when. Oh, sorry. When? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Tell me when. OK, and when? When, right, OK, that's that. So we heavily reduce that down, just to have a little look in that we've got in here as well. That's you cooking can... away. You can see now that the... the About the a minute left. Away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's going on there as well. And then you want me... So tell, you, you don't stop working for charity, you. So t you're not just working for that charity. You're doing all manner of different stuff. 
of the hospitality business. You still keep doing that. So what are you working on still at the moment? Well, I'm still president of the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts. And then we run a competition from Springboard called... Um, Young Chef? Future, Future, Future Chef. Future Chef, yeah. Did, have you judged ones? I've judged it, yeah. I th we may be asking you again sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and you're doing the Adopter School as well. And, and if that wasn't enough, I think the big one, really, that, that we're both involved in is the Rue Scholarship, which looks at... Just... just stir it. Stir it? I, I, stir I, it. I, I don't want it to catch. If, for your reputation, you're OK. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel under pressure doing this. <laughs> Actually, put a bit, bit more champagne in there now. A bit more in there. You can tell I'm okay. paying the bill for this uh, one, can't you? <laughs> exactly. Better that. So we're very fortunate in the, the Rue Scholarship. We, we, it's, it's 40th anniversary this year, and the young lady who won the Rue Scholarship this year yeah. was Li Lily, April Lily Partridge. Yeah. And she started in Future Chef. Did she start that? Well, yeah. So she was in So you've seen her all the way through. Absolutely right. Eh? Right. So we've got. So this is this is the sauce now. So we've got that. I've got some little bit of chives over here. I've got a little bit of tomato in here, and then we add the butter that we've got in here. I never really ask you this. Which was your most memorable time when you were when you were as a chef? Because you've now well not retired because you never retire you. But when you when you had your apron on proper professionally cooking, was that at Walton Street? Was the magical time for you? Yeah, it was. I never got a Michelin star in, but it was political, as you th these guys will tell tell you. It can tend to be sometimes. Now we, we get. A, a, I'll a pick little, that. Just we're not we're not going to chop it. If if pick it's it. nice, pick pick nice. Okay, I'll just lift this off. So that's your nice little bit of. Now, uh, before before you go, we don't we... juice. Oh man, the best bit. Fantastic. Okay. Happy with that? And I'm sure it's enough cooked. It's fine. It looks good to me. So I'll take this out. Chives in there, chef. Yes, please, boss. Please, yes, no problem. Next, tomatoes. Yes, we go. You sure? Yeah, yes, we, we're ready to get, we're ready to rock and roll. Happy with that? Pepper? We're just going to taste it again. It's, it's interesting, the it's tasting and tasting and tasting. Tasting and tasting. Look at all the spoons that he's used. Do you know, sometimes <laughs> I don't know how good I am. <laughs> 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 We love you, Brian. We right, love chef. you, man. So a little bit of that. I'm going to slide that off on there. I'm going to take these, slide that off on there. Those are done. We're then going to take our... You did want black pepper. Yes, right. I've changed my mind. So... <laughs> bit of that. And lift these out. On there. So... Happy me to plate up? With the spoon, yeah. OK. Thank you. Put on that. Oh, yeah, look at that. And they go in there. Beautiful. So you know it's going to taste good, this, though, don't you? Yeah. A very chef-y chowder. Whoa. It is, it is a chef-y, chef -y. Yeah. At least yeah. you know what a portion is, uh, Brian, yeah? Well, you know what a portion of uh, seafood. Well, I remember... Yeah. <laughs> 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 re that's a warning for you. Yeah. It's your <laughs> cookie day. <next. laughs> <laughs> look. A little bit of chervil on? Just a bit of chervil. And uh, plum centre. Plum centre. Plum centre. Plum centre. So give us the name of this dish. It's the Tower of Scallops and Smoked Hard Duck, dedicated to James Martin. Now, by a true, absolute legend. It's a pleasure having you this Christmas. <laughs> Mr Brian Turner! <laughs>
Have a Thank taste you of very that. much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a taste you. of Thank that. You well, as soon as you yeah. tasted this sauce 50 million times, should I have a little taste of it ourselves? No, oh, yeah. Yeah. You happy with that? Yeah, yeah, indeed. The haddock's still opaque. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. It, it wasn't overcooked. No, beautiful. But it, it, and it and undercooked his mouth, and the, the scallops look fantastic. Look at that. It's all good. Proper food, eh? Oh. Ryan, Ryan Turner, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got the genius, which is Gareth Ward. He'll be cooking for us later on the show. We've also got a show-stopping recipe in store for my guest Shirley Ballas at the end of the show. But see you back in a couple of minutes when I'll be giving you a mask glass in glazed hams for Christmas. See you in a bit. What do you reckon of that, Ralph? I think you'll like that one. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Now, there's still loads more to come for my guest, Shirley Ballas, and the man behind the number one restaurant in the entire country, and I definitely agree with that. Gareth Ward will be taking over this very kitchen. That's coming up next. But first, no pressure then, as it's time for this week's Little Mask Class. And this week, with Christmas just a few days away, I thought I'd show you three different ways how you can glaze a ham for this festive season. So, first of all, what do you do with the ham when you're faced with it? Well, first of all, gammon and ham are the same thing. It's one's cooked, it's simple as that. But the most important thing with this is really ask the butchers or the supermarket, it'll say on the back of the packet, if you do buy it from a packet, but really if you get it from the butchers, whether it needs to be soaked or not. And that's all to do with the brine that the ham is. Now, some of these can be brined and then pre-soaked, but either way, you, what you need to do is soak this, if possible. So if it does need soaking, it needs a good four or five hours. A lot of chefs would do this overnight, really. Soak it in water, that's it. But you're faced with a nice little ham like that. Leave the skin on, leave the string on as well, that's the most important bit, and then pop it into a deep pan. So that's going to go in there. Now, what we're going to do is fill this full of water, so cold water in there. So that's going to fill it all up. Now, if your pan like me is not quite big enough, don't worry, because we can turn this over while it's cooking as well, anyway, when you're doing that. So I'll just quickly wash my hands. There you go. And then what we do is add some aromats to this. Now, the aromats are pretty straightforward I like to use for ham. So I've just got some onion, I've got some apple, and I've got lemon. Now, I would stay clear of aromats that you're not going to enjoy if you think about the stock, because the stock from this is really essential. We can utilise this for other things as well once it's cooked. So things like the apple are perfect. A little bit of lemon, too, not too much. You can put things like orange if you wanted to. The onion, you can take the whole lot, skin the lot, pop it all in. Then what we add is different aromats that we've got in a, over here. So a classic Christmas aromats, really, are these we've got in here. We've got a little bit of cinnamon. I've got some star anise, which I absolutely love with ham as well. And I've got some cloves. It's entirely up to you whether you use one or all three, it doesn't matter. But you can add things like bay leaf if you wanted to in there as well. Now, what you want to do is bring this to a gentle simmer. Really, for a ham this sort of size, which is about three to four kilos, you're looking at something in about two and a half to three and a half hours, something like that. Depends on the size of it. The larger ham's obviously much more, four hours. Either way, just leave it gently simmering, cover it over. If, like this, you're a bit worried about it, don't worry, because it'll shrink slightly as it cooks as well. But you can turn this over after about halfway through. Whatever you do, leave the string on it like that. It'll just hold it all together. Particularly hold it all together while you allow it to cool. So once it's cooked, allow it to cool down at room temperature or pop it in the fridge, and this is what you end up with. There's a little bit of layer of fat on this. Once it's cold like this, you can skim off this little bit of fat. And this stock is brilliant for sort of pea and ham soup. It's absolutely delicious. But either way, we then take our ham out like that, and then I can take the string off. So just remove the string from this. And you can see straight away, if you allow it to cool down in the pan, the string will just hold it together as it cools. If you do this while it's still hot, it'll just break apart like that. So, so often, People just think you can do this while it's still warm. You really want this to come to sort of room temperature or cool right down. And you end up with this glorious bit of ham that we've got in here. So at that point in time, I'm going to put that into our little pan. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a wipe down over here. Because then we can concentrate how we're going to glaze this. Now, I'm going to do three different glazes with this one. You can take all three. You can have one of them. It's entirely up to you. But either way, you can utilise these glazes for other things. So some of which you can use for your turkey this Christmas as well. So. We're going to take off like that. Now, I'm going to do 
a sort of a, a marmalade glaze, first of all. So we're going to do this marmalade one. We take some nice orange marmalade, take a spoon, and pop this over the top, like that. So decent amount. A whole pot, really, like that. Then, once you get to that stage, we can then add a few different spices over here. So I can add some nice little bits of lemon. That can go in here. So a couple of wedges of lemon. Then I can take the spices that we've got and add a few more. Over here, I've got some mustard seeds. Different coloured mustard seeds. White and dark mustard seeds. They go on there. I love this sort of spiced one as well. Then we can grab some cloves, a few bits of those. A couple of sticks of cinnamon over the top. A little bit of star anise. But whenever you're doing anything with sugar like this, particularly when it comes to honey, I'm going to show you that one in a second, it's a good idea to take some water. Just to get a bit of water over there. Not too much. Probably want a couple of hundred mils, something like that. So then as this cooks, because you're going to set the oven 200 degrees, and the same temperature for all of these hams, 200 degrees. It's quite a hot oven. So as it cooks, this will grate a lovely little syrup. And it wants to be in there for about half an hour. Every 10 minutes, you baste it. The nearer it gets to the half an hour, every five minutes. So think about it, probably the first 20 minutes, maybe twice. The, certainly the last 10 minutes, probably three or four times, you want to take this out and baste it. And particularly when it comes out of the last bit, you can baste it again. But either way, this goes straight in the oven for the first bit. And what you end up with that one is this glaze over here, this glorious sort of glaze as it starts to thicken up like that. Now, if you don't put that little bit of water in there, this is just going to be horrible and black and burn. So a little bit of water is a good tip to that one. The next one, we'll turn our attention, is this one, your classic, classic honey glazed ham over here. So this one, take another little pot, and then we can take your ham, whichever one you think and you like, like that. And then what I do with this one is score this. So just take a knife and you score this over the skin. Now, a lot of people will take the skin off, but I used to be a pig farmer. <laughs> and this, you, my granny would get so upset if we took the skin off like this and got rid of it. Because this, I used to fight for this as a kid once it's glazed. Trust me, it's absolutely delicious. And then you take your cloves like this. So you want the, the cloves and you can pop this usually in where the two crosses meet. But it's entirely up to you. Life's too short to find all that. But either way, particularly you're busy enough at Christmas anyway, just take the cloves and we stud it all in the top like that. This is where finding those little crosses where the two bits of slices that you've made in between the fat, this is where these little cloves will actually just stick in. But you want to take these and stud it all over the top. I mean, the massive hams are going to take you a while, but this is only quite a small one, so it's not too bad. But just stud it all over the top, like that. And the same process applies. So when you're doing this, set the oven again, 200 degrees, and have this quite hot. So the great thing about this is you can prepare this way in advance, as we all know, because nice cold hams for Christmas is amazing, but plenty, plenty of cloves over the top, like that. So stood them all in. There we go. You should be always buying these cloves anyway. I've done so many white sauces on this show as well with a thing called an onion clouté, which is so vital, I think, for this. But you can take your nice little bit of ham like that, few bits more, but either way, make sure you've got plenty of these cloves studded in, because you get this amazing flavour from them. So those are going to go in. Then, what we do is grab our honey. So you want a good glug of honey for this one. Honey glazed ham is a good glug of ham and honey. Look, there. Now, if I put that straight in the oven as it is, it's just going to burn, a bit like the marmalade. So again, a little bit of water, 200 mils of water in the bottom like that. And that way, as it cooks, what will happen is this will glaze over. You'll get this wonderful little sauce with it and keep basting it exactly like the marmalade one. After about sort of 20 minutes, then keep it, take it out every sort of three or four minutes. Get really, really hot as it starts to colour up and keep glazing it like that. As soon as it comes out, glaze it even more as it's cooling down. And as you glaze it even more as it's cooling down, that glaze will actually set onto the ham as it's cooling. But either way, again, straight into a hot oven. That's that one. When it comes out of the oven, it looks like this. Your classic, classic honey roast ham. It looks glorious, doesn't it, like that? Our classic one is something slightly different. This is where you can actually use this for your turkey. 
But what you need to do is you take your ham like this. If you're doing this with a turkey, you would cook probably, if your turkey took four hours to cook, after three hours, that's when you do the glaze. So take the tin foil off, then make the glaze. But you do need to drain off the gubbins from the tray, uh, all your juices and bits and pieces, so your tray is almost dry in the bottom. Add a little bit of water, but then add some of this. This stuff. We've got an Irish chap on the show. He'd love this, Mr Corrigan. You take some Guinness, like that, over the top. Now, this may appear weird, but you can actually do this with soft drinks. Uh, cherry Coca-Cola, that kind of stuff, Coca-Cola, that kind of stuff. You can do this. I'm going to say practice that over your turkey this Christmas or Christmas Day, but this will work. So honey and that over the top. Then you do exactly the same thing as we did before, but this will take a little bit longer. This is probably going to take another, probably, this is probably going to take about 40 minutes to cook. When it comes out of the oven, it's really important when you do this, as it comes out, you keep basting it every sort of three or four minutes, like that, for a good 10 minutes, and it'll glaze over into this beautiful ham. But that is your Guinness glaze ham. The same thing with the turkey. Once about an hour towards the end of it, as it comes out, keep glazing it, glazing it, and you end up with these three amazing hams, which I'm going to pop, pop on here. Whichever recipe you do, so you've got your... This is the first one I made, which is this glorious... Let's bring this over. This is this wonderful marmalade glazed ham, which we can take off. That one. You can see, looks amazing, tastes amazing as well. You've got the second one that I made over here, which is the honey roast ham, which is your classic, classic, beautiful honey glazed ham. You've got this amazing little sauce as well. These keep this liquor over the top. Put this and keep it in the fridge, and then when your things like parsnips come out of the oven, these over parsnips and carrots, this liquid, unbelievable. So don't waste any of that, because that's delicious. And you can still use this glaze as well for your parsnips as well, but this one is your Guinness glazed ham over the top. Either way, whichever ham you decide to use, the glazes are amazing, particularly these two ones, uh, rather than the marmalade one, for your vegetables. But there you have it. My glazed honey roast ham, marmalade ham, and Guinness roast ham. Done. Yay! Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about, little mask us, then do get in touch. we see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break now, but join me again when the mega-talented Mr Gareth Ward, the UK's number one chef, will be taking over this very kitchen. I'll see you in a bit. It's not bad, though, that. Welcome back. I'll be making the ultimate loaded potato skins and deep fried chicken for my guest Shirley Ballas. That's coming up next. But first, I'm here with Richard and Brian, and we're about to enjoy a dish from a chef whose North Wales restaurant has been voted the best place to eat in the entire British Isles. Not just this year, but last year as well. It's a brilliant Gareth Ward. Yeah. Now, gentlemen, you've never tasted it. I am so excited. You've stitched me up today, you are. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm so excited this gentleman's here. Purely for, I want to see the reaction of these gentlemen's faces when you taste this food. Because the three best meals I've ever had in my life have been the three times I've eaten at his oh, place. It is epic. So what are you going to be doing? It's bad enough cooking for you, you know, with all these two. Well, these two as well. So I'm too <laughs> excited to see their faces. That's what I want to see. So right. we've got some beautiful amachi here, yellowtail, yeah. so it's yes. part of the tuna family. Yeah. So this has been in our... We have a minus 80 freezer at, at uh, the restaurant. Yeah. This has been in there. We blast freeze it down. What does the 80. minus 80 do? It just does the opposite of boiling, so it? It kills all of the bugs and everything in there that are present in raw fish. OK. You shouldn't really eat raw fish without it going down at least below minus 40. OK. Yeah, so it just makes it safe. Right. Right, so you've got to do two dishes with this, then. Yeah, so I'll so let you butcher this up. We've got, the, we've got the belly part, obviously, down there, which is the fattiest part, and then okay. you've got the top loin. So we're just going to just break it down now. So... Where did your love affair with Japanese food come from? Because you've only, until recently, been out there. Yeah, I only went out in April. Right. Went out for eight days. Went to meet the, the guy who uh, makes our soy sauce. Yeah. So um, it's just... I love them flavours. I love the whole ethos. You've never been out there? No, never. It's the same as Thai food and Chinese and everything. I just love them flavours. So it's all like, it's basically just, I, I cook what I love to eat, same as this man here. Yeah. You know, we've just tasted an unbelievable dish from him, but, which was, um, it's, it's just what he loves to cook. But uh, I mentioned the fact that your restaurant is your restaurant. I mean, yours at the time, Brian, you had a restaurant in Walton Street. That was you all over it. Absolutely. But you, you as well, th th your restaurant, explain to everybody where it is and what it is, because you've, you've changed it a lot. Yeah, so when I took, well, when I arrived, 
at Inner Sea, it was a country house hotel. Yeah. Seven days a week. With a fancy yeah. wallpaper and breakfast, the... lunch, dinner, the whole the whole the whole shebang. Yeah. And now you've painted it. Painted it black, ripped most of the walls out inside, painted all the inside really dark green. Yeah. It's got, got a DJ. It's amazing. <laughs> so just look at the show people the fat of this. Yeah, just so look at the fat of that. You can see if you rub your fingers across it how fat it is. You know? So and you've had this in the, you've had this, it comes out of the freezer, yeah. you've then had this in the salt chamber in for the, how long? In the salt chamber for a week. Right. Yeah, and then we're just going to take this, the belly bit out first. We want to take the belly bit out first because I want to marinate it very quickly in this, which is a soy sauce. Okay. Uh, with a mirin, sugar, um, some uh, kombu and bonito. So it's like a bit like it's called a tarry. So it's right, like a mother, yeah. a mother sauce. And when you mentioned the fact you went to Japan for the for the soy, when you taste soy sauce, that you've never tasted soy sauce like no. until you've had proper soy sauce. This yeah. the the soy sauce that we use is from the Shivanuba family, and they've yeah. been making soy sauce for three hundred and fifty years. The same family and it's just passed down it's like 19th generation now yeah. um and it is mind-blowing we've we've witnessed it being made we've yeah. we've we've seen the process it is it's it's one of the best soy sauces on the market it's completely raw soy sauce yeah. as well so you're going to put that and then pop it in the yeah. so you slice it so we're just taking taking the belly off the bottom like, like so yeah and then we're just going to make sure all the bones are out we've got this beautiful collar bit here which we're just going to take out because the bone just runs through the middle there yeah <clears throat> Gonna cut this in half, I thought, and we're just gonna leave that in there. Right. So I'm just gonna slice this up now. I'm gonna give you this guy this, this, just to try as it is because it's. Just, I'm gonna take it and sell it. You've got just a, look at the way that it's working with a knife. Fantastic. You know? You've got to appreciate what this is. Like, you can't overcomplicate this stuff. I've had people going like, oh. I've, the fish dishes were a bit simple at the restaurant. I'm like, what, what, what do you want me to do with it? You know what I mean? It's but all the work you've done, tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you the first bit, though. Completely unseasoned. Thank you. It's it's, it's magic, isn't it? It's such an incredible piece of fish. And that's raw. That's that's yeah, just, just just raw. <laughs> We're just going to put a few lines in this here, so when we brush it with a tarry. So this one gets this. Are you going to cook this one, or no, are you no, going to cook this one? This one's raw. That okay. one is is almost raw. We just okay. all we're going to do with that is um, flash it on the barbecue. Flash it on the barbecue. And this one you want to put in the small dishes. Is this one? Is this? This one's for the big dishes. The big dishes. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to put that on there like so. And the attention to detail you've got. These these dishes are made with the the stone from your place. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 we've got a little stream at the bottom of the garden. Right. The old potter comes over and takes all the all the stones out and she smashes it all up and mixes it through there. The clay, so we, and she uses the ash out the fire as glaze as well. All right. So this is the little tarry, the same stuff that's in there. We just brush this Already the quiet, they haven't tasted the real thing yet. <laughs> and how long do you leave that, just as it is? Just a couple of seconds, not long. Right. So what have you got in there? This, what this, is, that? Is, this is that. So that's this is the, that? Yeah, okay. the tarry, the soy sauce, yeah. So we're going to leave that there for now. OK. Right, what's next? What, right, what... so we're going to slice this fish up and we're going to skewer it. Yeah. Just like so. And what I also love about your place is that not just the food, the food's spectacular, but the, the drinks menu, you've probably got, what, two gins? Had, you know, the, the, yeah. it's really specific. It is, yeah, we use a local gym company. In my opinion, it's one of the best gins on the planet. Yeah. And it's, look, we know Have the guys... Have you tasted them all? I've tasted them all, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been through a few. Good man, good man. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, you're going to barbecue. Yeah. So we're just going to skewer this like that. Like so. We'll get this straight. And we're yeah. just going to barbecue this over here. And this is where you want yeah. a little bit of... You want to get a bit of heat, because we don't want to cook it. We just want to char it. Did you bring this fan? Yeah. Is this your fan? It's my fan. It's my biggest fan. Getting covered in dust. Well, it's covered over you and me, <laughs> so... Yeah, you that, did, did, we've got dandruff already. Happy with that? Yeah, oh, look at that. that. Look at that. That's, That's right. what you want. We'll just pop this him is off. almost ready to serve then. Yeah, we, it is, yeah, we're we'll not far off. Pop him off onto the tray. Just like so. And this is what I love about when you come to your place, you're always behind this thing. Just... Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the stove. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready to stop cooking yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still going. Still going strong. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So we'll get rid of that. Yeah. And we'll put these dishes together. Which so... plates do you want first? So we'll have the we'll have the big ones first. The big ones first. Yeah. All right. 
They go on that. So these. I'm going to get rid of the ash off me. Yeah. <laughs> onto you, onto you us. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Right. So a bit of this, this um, Amachi in the bottom. And this is the thing is with yours, it's 30 odd courses, but little. Yeah, it's you all one mouthfuls. Whack of flavour. Yeah. yeah. So what's, gonna... what's the thinking, because I'm an older man now, <clears throat> of serving a big bowl and a, a little bowl? So that's one course, yeah. that's another course. That's another, two different courses. So you, when you come to the restaurant... Two separate courses. We make, we make two dishes out of the whole fish, so we use everything. But, uh, but every dish is uh, served in a different... In a yeah. different, a different, a di different bowl. Bowl, OK. So we're just going to grind this wasabi. So this is the shark skin. This is the shark skin, yeah. Uh, you see, I don't like horseradish, because no. I just don't like the taste of it. Horseradish and wasabi are but very different. They're a totally you know? different thing, isn't it? Yeah, completely different. It's not even the same no. planet. A lot of, but, uh, but the thing is, a lot like people say, oh, I hate wasabi, but they've never had real wasabi because no. a lot of wasabi is fake. You know, yeah. there's not enough wasabi in it's the world. It's green horseradish. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's got food colouring, hasn't it? Right. So you just put a tiny little bit in there. Yeah, you don't need a lot. Just a little bit. Just give it a kick, isn't it? Yeah. That freshness. So wasabi like really seasons raw fish. I absolutely love it. Just like that. And then we've got this white white dressing here. Okay. Made from the white there? soy. So this is the white soy, uh, brown rice, sake, mirin, yeah. sugar, and then um, split with a white, a beautiful white, uh, like really light roasted sesame oil. OK. It's delicious so little this dressing. Is your, it appears really simple, but the workload that goes into every single dish, that's... I mean, some of the the beef you say you're marinate, you're, you've got it in the salt chamber for a year. Yeah. You know, it's the work that goes into what appears to be quite simple. It's is... a process, isn't it? Well, it is. Say that. The, but it's, just... the ingredient, it's all about the ingredient, isn't it? The restaurant have, like is all about the ingredient for me. What next? And we've got some like unbelievable nori. I love this. This is the sweetened sort of stuff. Yeah, this it? is absolutely glass. I'm just going to flip my board over there because I've had raw fish on it. <clears throat> What makes a good nori? Because it's, it's, it's something that doesn't do it for me, Gareth. It's, Normal nori is it's just, you know. This is sweet. It's absolutely right. beautiful. The nori world is a, is a crazy world. That's a different... It's a crazy world. It's more caragini, uh, yeah. caragini mossy, it's a different you know. Planet, yeah. isn't it? Mm. There we go. So that's that dish done. So there's the first one done. And then we've got one more. Yep. So I'll leave that one there. We'll get rid of that. Can we have a look at it? Just, yeah. just... There you go. And then the second one. Right. And then the second one. How did you cope with it, James? Getting <coughs> such a small portion. Because I knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah. Does, look, at, look at it. Does he look like the guy that's going to serve small portions to you when you go out to a meal? No, well, he can, he can do, and he can eat fish and chips on He's the He's not back. going to, to be honest with you. What's so this? This is so the teriyaki Yes, yeah, so we've got the little barbecued fish, and we're just going to dress that with a bit of teriyaki sauce. And for me, you can't beat really beautiful fatty fish just off the yeah. barbecue with some teriyaki sauce on it. It's just a match made in, match made in heaven for me. So that's that one. This is just beautiful. And then what we've else got, you got here? some hearts out of spring onions. Just a really tender bit in, in the centre. <laughs> and we just pickle them. But these these so delicious, so tender. Yeah. The, the, the best bit. So is that that everything? Yep, that's it. That's so the two there portions. we have it. So you can explain those dishes then. We have first of all explain <coughs> which one that's in here. So you've got the um, uh, matchy loin, which is just raw, served with some British wasabi, nori, and a white sesame dressing yep. with with white um, white soy. Yeah. And the belly, which has been barbecued with a teriyaki sauce and some spring onion. The legend. That is Gareth Ward. No pressure. Thank you for watching. <laughs>
This you taste just, just with a fork? Yeah, same, same thing. Get your tongue in there, innit? <laughs> Get the teriyaki sauce out. I'm still savouring the first course. It's just such a special product, mm. isn't it? It's divine. Divine. Thank you, mate. Absolutely divine. What do you think, Bry? Mind blowing. Gareth Ward, everybody. Gareth. Yeah. That is a Christmas treat. That is absolutely delicious. Right, we've still got time for one more final course uh, when I'll be rustling up some pretty epic loaded potato skins with deep fried chicken for Shirley Ballas and all the crew. I'll see you after the break. Bye for now. That is amazing. Welcome back. Now, welcome back to the final part of the show. <laughs> but I'm back in the kitchen with Gareth Richard and the amazing Shirley Ballas. And I'm thinking, what dish to cook for Ralphie as well as everybody else? So I thought I'd do uh, southern fried chicken. Yes. With and and I've well I've borrowed his version. His, his version of a cherry coke barbecue sauce is epic. Yeah. It, it is. Epic. It takes a long time to make. A long time. Yeah. A long time. We're going to do a simplified version of that. We're going to southern fried chicken with and we're going to serve it with loaded potato <laughs> skins using some of the ham that we made. And I, this is the Guinness cooked ham that I made earlier. So in here we've got some flour. I've got some range of spices over here. Oregano, marjoram, a little bit of garlic salt. That's all going to go in there. Mix all that, that together, Chief. Yeah. So I can give you that and that yeah. to take over. That's your job. You can do all that. I want that. Meanwhile, we're going to do our loaded potato skins. So I've got my t potatoes over, over here. I've got my uh, inside the potatoes. We're going to put some Telegio cheese and some of this amazing ham, which I made earlier. And then I'm going to basically chop it all up and then we're going to cook this just under the grill. But this, this ham, this is this Guinness glazed ham over the top, which I've got to give you a little piece of. So that's the Guinness glazed Huge ham. Piece. There you go. Mmm. Mm. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> a country boy with a piece of ham. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's all right, isn't it? It's all over, Gareth. Yeah. <laughs> it's all over. So Gareth's frying away there, 160 degrees with the oil like this. I'm going to take these and I'm going to fill it full of the potato skins with, with some of the potatoes as well. So, Shirley, t you're here with the book as well, but, you know, obviously Strictly takes over everybody's lives at Christmas and stuff like that. You then go from pillar to boss all around the world and then you have time to write something like this. We touched on it a bit earlier. This is a new venture for you, though. You've done autobiographies, bits and pieces. This is something slightly different. It's completely different for me. A little bit outside my comfort zone, but when you've got as many stories as I've got to tell, yeah. <laughs> it actually wasn't so difficult. But so to explain to me, we touched on it earlier. Those people who are just waking up uh, on a Saturday morning. This is, this is based not on true stories-ish, but this is, this is based on, on, on a story that starts off at a of a dance competition, and then it's sort of the, the story then continues. So it's give built us a little on insight sex, a lies, intrigue, backstabbing, bed hopping, a little murder going on, and some ballroom dancing. It's set in the tower ballroom. The most beautiful Oksana Bondarenko drops dead at Jack's feet doing the tango. Who murdered Oksana Bondarenko? Hello, who <laughs> murdered her? So it is, and then you have to guess did I take part in it? Did I witness it? Or is it fiction? Because there are some saucy bits in there, you know? Wow. And you, when you read it, you have to imagine, could I have possibly taken part in it? The answer <laughs> now, probably now, is yes. <laughs> I, I've had the privilege to take... I, I think you've lived this life. <laughs> I'm sitting beside you, you've lived this life. <laughs> I didn't think anybody Allegedly. could shock Richard Corrigan, and now we've actually found somebody. <laughs> You're coming back, definitely, when oh, he's back. I'm <laughs> telling you. No, I didn't, I didn't realise this. Uh, uh, when, obviously, the Winter Gardens, how, how special a place it was. Because I, I toured just a couple of months ago. Is that really the place... If you're looking at sort of ballroom and Latin, would, there's, there's obviously a holy grail of somewhere that you want to go to. Would that, that be, is that the global place? There is nowhere in the world like Blackpool. The Tower Ballroom you dance in from ages about 4 to 16, and then you move from 16 to the Winter Gardens. But the tower has the best floor, the best sprung floor in the world. Wow. Right. It bounces up and down when you're doing the quick step. And even when you're judging on that seat, you are still <laughs> bouncing. Small, small lats. It's very small lats. Oh, I don't... Yes, I suppose so. Yes, but it's very <laughs> bouncy. <laughs> How do you know? I don't. I'm just, I'm just wandering here. Yeah. <laughs> is, that st is that still the place? Is that still... Oh, it's the, it's the place everybody in the world wants to come to and, and perform in. Wow. 
Yeah, so I go all the time. So tell me, when, when was the transition for you to do the Latin as opposed to ballroom? Because, you know, the two of... I, I mean, I've, like I said, scratched the surface, but I do know the two are similar, but they're not similar. The two are very, very different. When was that transition for you? I've always done ten dances, and I was primarily a ballroom dancer up until I was about 17. Right. And then I got the opportunity with Sammy Stopford. I specialised in Latin with him, and then we just skyrocketed. It, they called us the non-stop Stopfords because we got married as well, you know. Yeah. The non-stop Stopfords to the very, very top of the industry, and that's when I took up Latin. But my, my, one of my biggest passions is the ballroom. Is it, is it, I mean, I get the feeling in Latin, you, 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 the scope, you can, you've got freedom to do bits and pieces, but it's regimented with ballroom. Is that, is that, is that the key to it? Or and is that... I think that's a, that's a little bit of an illusion because they're both very, very difficult, very difficult styles, both of them in their well, own What I mean right. with Latin, you can also, you can adapt it, you could change it a little bit more. Well, him and I could have a little shimmy shake. <laughs> <laughs> shake, shake, is a little shimmy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always find that flamenco. Is that Latin? And... Paso doble, darling. Yeah, I've seen a video of this 19, uh, uh, 1938 Spanish flamenco dancer, a woman. Oh, okay. And I, I just thought, you know, wow, the discipline of it. Just a pure, rigid discipline well, of that dance well, was all in the feet. Side by side, but when we do the waltz, we have to have pure body contact. I'm more Michael Flatley myself. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the body contact is the uh, thing. <laughs> <laughs> You have to Take him high, darling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stay connected. Him. Now, he was good yeah. at ballroom. He was very good at ballroom when he was on Strictly. Ballroom, ballroom, you see, I, I, one of the most magical things, I think you've got to get a certain stage in Strictly to then... Then it suddenly clicks about halfway through, you suddenly think, this is amazing. Yeah. And you, you really, you're only just sort of look, you're, I mean, scratching the surface is not even, it's not even that. But you, when you're doing it, you just think, this is, this is the most amazing thing. I remember doing Strictly, and particularly Ballroom, when uh, we did it the first time, and somebody said, you've gone through 12 steps to get from one end of the room to the other. I said, when you know what you're doing, and when you, when it clicks for you, you'll do that in four. Four steps. Four. Ooh. Wow. I remember getting to the quarterfinal and they took this video and it, you go across in four steps. It's the most amazing feeling. Because you strive. It's just incredible, and you move, isn't it? It's but amazing. I suppose you're, you're having to do yeah. that in front of not just an audience, but in front of everybody else who's dancing at the same time as well. That's correct. And on live TV, imagine. So you see, you did very well with that and you understood the rules. You've I, got to it, shift your butt to move. You do. Well, you, uh, what people don't understand is I think it's like anything. We, we've had. Uh, athletes on the show as well, and uh, it's the amount of work that you put in behind the scenes that that astounds people. It's, For, a, it's a discipline. Have you it's ever calculated how much time that goes into it for one minute of? Well, well, my regime was always about eight or nine hours a day practicing, and then on top of that, I had to work. So I always think with a little bit of talent, but with great work ethic, you can actually reach great heights. You don't have to be the most talented person, but you need to be the person that's willing to put the most uh, work in. 75 hours, yeah. you find success. In yeah. the restaurant, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so really. So it's the same thing. Yeah. So you can explain what we've got in here. You've got the chicken cooking away nicely. Yeah, got all cooking away. Do you want this rest in the oven after? Yeah. I've got my barbecue sauce, <laughs> which is over here. Then we're going to take some cherry... I've never heard of that. Of oh, this. Oh, yeah. Cherry This over the top of ham, you can do as well. Meanwhile, I've got some a little bit of uh, spring onion over here as a little garnish. I'm going to use some mint and some coriander. So what's Christmas in the Shirley Ballas household like then? What, what's Christmas all for you then? Are you, you going to go away? or is, I know well, your mum is you're, you're, you're extremely close to your mum. You spend time at home? Well, for many years we didn't celebrate it because obviously I lost my brother at Christmas, but over the last four or five years, We've now started to put up a tree and we've got all our trimmings up this year and it'll be Mum and I will set a little table together and then we will either call in to have the food done or my mother will cook something. Because your mother does a lot of cooking at home as she well. She does all the cooking. All of it? All the washing and ironing. Oh, I love you, Mum. Thank you so much. All the washing and ironing, all the cooking. Right. She's right there on a Saturday night when I go in with her arms like this, like, OK, let's talk about those marks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. She's the mother of all mothers, let me tell you. Love it. So you've got the chicken there. We're ready to put this in, so... Yeah. Wow. That sauce is done. Does that look yummy? There. It does look yummy. I'm going to take this, so the chicken can go on here. Yeah. That's bits for yeah. me, me and thee, those me bits. me and But look, we'll take our chicken. So Your southern fried chicken. This goes on here. This is just the start of it. It's bit of that. start of it. Shirley, you're at my house now. We don't, we don't do little portions. <laughs> we do food. Oh and then my. you take this. 
I'd never get my Strictly frock if I lived here. <laughs> that was the problem with me, I think. That's... <laughs> Having said that, I can still get in, still get in the gear. Still... Oh. Can you? Yeah, you spandex so... trousers? Mm, not so much. Oh, well, That's hello. Latin. I can do the ballroom <laughs> sort of stuff. But look, a bit of that. And then we've got over here, we've got a bit of mint, a bit of coriander, Look sprinkle over the top. And then I've got some spring onions over the top of there as well. And then we're going to then take out of our oven our loaded potato skins, which have been in the oven. That's got the ham, it's got the potatoes, it's got the spring onion, a <coughs> bit of that over the top. And then we take this. There you have your loaded potato skins. Oh, yeah. To go with it. Me bon appetit and happy Christmas from me and thee. Uh, there we go. Done. <laughs> right, Gareth, that's for me and thee. Oh, yeah. And we'll have a. Like, should we have, should we share one of these, or should we pass Careful. these pass these over to there? You're, oh, you're going to get the whole thing, guys. So oh, you, really? You're just going to get a whole thing. Oh my goodness! Right, you start at one end and work your way through it. Have a little bit of the chicken, a little bit of that. Oh, we got potato Gareth, going on here. Gareth, there's a spoon. Yeah. I'll chop it all up there. <laughs> there you go. Oh my goodness! This is just chicken. Fine. Good, that leg. Mm -hmm. Do all right there. Do all right there, isn't it? Yeah. That's absolutely phenomenally delicious. That's good, though, isn't it? Very good. Happy with the skins? Oh, yeah. They get, take them back to Wales. Yeah. I'm having that. <laughs> I'm having that. I go in the car. Then. I'm not going to argue with them either. <laughs> That's it. That's all we've got time for today. Matthew, the wow. to all my guests Andrea and Chris on the Isle of Man, Brian Turner, Gareth Ward, Rich Gorin, and of course, Shirley Ballis. <laughs> Best luck with the book as well. Uh, we'll see you back here on Christmas Day at the later time of 12 pm. I'm going to be celebrating the big day with more top chefs, more delicious recipes, more incredible cocktails, more brilliant guests, and maybe a bit of rock and roll to mix as well. Until then, take care. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Like that?